please do so. Uh, I'm going to get started. So my name is Jennifer Lupiba, and I'm the chair of the Experts Conference uh, sponsored by Quest. And um, leading up to the Experts Conference, I'll tell you about it in a minute, we do these things called Tech Talks, sort of mini sessions, standalone sessions. It's all about uh, diving into a topic, and it's not about product pitches. You know, we're not going to show you a... Um, I'm not going to show you a Quest product here at the end. It's all about just um, connecting you with the experts in these fields and, and hoping we all walk away learning something. And the Experts Conference, as you see on the screen here, is very much in that vein. Um, we have an in-person event this year. The last couple of years, it's been virtual. This year, we're going to be in person in Atlanta, Georgia, September 20 and 21. Uh, this is going to be a smaller event, uh, probably up to 400 people. Um, so it's a great place for you to come and get and engage with people like Andy Robbins uh, from Spectre Ops. Um, he's one of our speakers at Tech. Um, with our keynotes, Alex Swinert, who's the director of identity security at Microsoft. He's the guy that stands between Azure AD and the bad guys. Uh, Paula Yanuskovich, um, a Microsoft MVP regional director. Um, she's going to be flying in uh, from Poland. She's a, a cybersecurity expert talking about the hacker's perspective to help organizations um, uh, figure out their their priorities for the year. Sean Metcalf is a Microsoft certified master with Active Directory, um, big focus on Azure AD. We've got a lot of other um, experts in the field. We've got tracks on Microsoft Infrastructure Security, uh, Microsoft 365, um, and then we also uh, work with our on-prem and hybrid management and migration scenarios. If you've got some uh, like tenant to tenant type migration projects coming up. You know, you definitely want to take a look at the experts conference. I know Katie's going to post in the chat um, a link to the experts conference. You can go to the expertsconference.com or just follow the link that you'll see in the chat. Um, we are an ISC squared CPE submitter. So if you have a CISSP or a CCSP or one of those IC squared um, certifications, when you register and you give us your um, member ID, we will submit your attendance on your behalf. Um, right now, we're uh, estimating up to um, 10 CPEs. Sometimes I try to put in a little bit more and an IC squared usually works with me on that. So take a look at the experts conference. Um, we hope you sign up. We have early bird pricing ending here on May 31. So definitely take a look at it. Uh, it is a smaller conference and it's a great way to have those one on one conversations. Uh, conversations with Alex, with Andy, with Sean, with Paula, um, and so forth. Um, so uh, moving on, because I know we're here. Um, oop, I skipped this slide about tech, this tech. Uh, there's a lot of other things apart from talking to the experts there. One thing I want to hit on this slide, uh, two things, Spectre Ops. So Andy's from Spectre Ops are going to be a sponsor at tech, so we'll be there. You'll be able to talk with them in person. Um, the cool thing I'm really excited about are the villages. Uh, these are these sort of ad hoc training centers you can go to during the breaks and try your hand at 80 hacking scenarios. Um, so Microsoft 365 shortcuts. We've got a, a petting zoo for Teams, Rooms, Devices. That's exactly what it sounds like. You can go and you know put your hands on the on the on the equipment. Um, and then we've got sort of a, a fun debate uh, challenge table around Active Directory recovery plans. Um, so it's going to be a, a really great experience, and I hope you um, take a look at the experts conference. Um, but today we are here to talk with and hear from and learn from Andy Robbins. So he's here on the line. He's a technical architect with Spectre Ops. Um, he is an active red teamer. He's a co-author of Bloodhound. Um, this is a tool uh, you'll see um, today. There's the free version of the tool that helps to reveal hidden and unintended permission relationships in Active Directory domains. Um, he's also a tech speaker this year. So at this point, I don't want to take any more time. I want to make sure that uh, we get Andy in front of you as much as we can. Um, so Andy, welcome to our Tech Talk. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, welcome. So go ahead and start sharing my screen. And thanks for, the, thanks for that intro. So here is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we'll talk about three things regarding attack paths in Azure. First of all, how do they emerge? So where do they come from? And I'll talk about both the very explicit 
configurations that can create those attack paths, but also the implicit or the unintended configurations like Jennifer mentioned that create these attack paths as well. Uh, we'll go through a demo of a full attack path starting from initial access into an Azure tenant all the way through a subscription and then uh, up to global administrator level privilege. And at the end, I'll show you how you can use uh, a free and open source product that, that I'm a co-author of called Bloodhound. You can use this to identify and get rid of those attack paths in your Azure environment before a real attacker can find and exploit them. So let's look first at how attack paths emerge. So the most obvious way that an attack path in Azure can emerge is going to be through what I refer to as an explicit configuration. And so you could think of this as being kind of synonymous to a user having full control of another user in Azure, or in, I'm sorry, in on-prem Active Directory. So that's just a one-to-one -one relationship. It means that one user can reset the other user's password and there's really nothing else to it. It's about that simple. And there are examples of this in Azure as well. Most notably, when you look at the explicit owners of particular kinds of objects, service principles and apps are two types of those objects that can have explicit owners set on them. And so here in the Azure portal, we're looking, <coughs> excuse me, we're looking at a service principle where its display name is My Cool Azure App. And we've navigated to the owners tab over here. And we can see that there is one explicit owner on this service principle, and it's this user called David McGuire. We're going to start looking at these things as a graph, uh, a graph being uh, a thing that is uh, from a branch of mathematics called combinatorics. And graphs are comprised of edges and nodes. So that looks like this. We have our user here on the left, David McGuire, and he's a node. And this edge or this relationship owns goes directly from David to the service principle called My Cool Azure App. I'm going to show you how this can be exploited in the attack path demo, but I'll tell you now that anybody who is an explicit owner of a service principle they can create a new credential for that service principle, and then they can authenticate to various Azure services as this service principle and gain whatever privileges it is that this service principle has. This explicit configuration, it doesn't exist in isolation, even though it is an isolated thing, there are going to be things around it, as we will see. And so it's important to keep in mind that there are going to be other principles in Azure or maybe even in on-prem AD or a different IDP that have control of David. And then there are going to be other things or other privileges that this service principle has as well. So we're gonna to start to build this up and see how that happens and how this can kind of quickly spiral out of control, even though this looks like just one simple configuration. Let's add something into the mix. So we're gonna shift these two to the left. So here's David and here's that service principle. And we're gonna give that service principle an Azure AD admin role. And it's gonna be the cloud application administrator role. When you give a service principle an Azure AD admin role, it actually can only be the type of role assignment that is permanently assigned. It can't be a eligible role assignment. So the service principle is always going to have this role. What has emerged out of these two explicit configurations is an attack path connecting the David McGuire user to the cloud application administrator role. 
So David can add a credential to this service principle, then authenticate as this service principle to the MS Graph API, for example. And because we're authenticating as this service principle, we now have this Azure AD admin role, whereas before David didn't have it and no admin had specified that David is allowed to have that role. So let's get a little more complicated. And let's look now at how implicit configurations can create attack paths. So we already saw that David owns this service principle and that service principle has the cloud application admin role. And we saw how that attack path works. Let's shift these three things to the left now. So there's David, there's a service principle and there's the role. Now in Azure Active Directory, the Azure AD admin roles, the way that they work is they describe a scope of actions that anybody with that role is allowed to do. And those actions include the type of object that you're allowed to do something against. So for example, global admin is just star. It's just you could do anything to any object or the groups administrator role. One of the things it says is that you can add a member to any security group that is not role eligible. The cloud application administrator role means that anybody with this role assignment can take control of every app and every service principle in Azure AD. So let's add three other service principles. There they are. And this service principle, my cool Azure app, because it has the cloud application administrator role, it's going to be able to add a credential to that service principle. It can add a credential to that service principle. It can add a credential to that service principle. It could add a credential to itself as well. Now, one of these service principles, let's give some more privilege to. Let's say that we have some kind of DevOps business case for automating the granting of other roles to users in Azure AD, like an automatic user provisioning and onboarding uh, uh, set of automation. So in order to facilitate that, we might take this service principle here in the middle and give it the privileged role admin role. So this is not global admin, but it lets you give people global admin. It lets you give people any Azure AD role that you like. So now, because of the implicit control that this service principle has over every other service principle, the attack path has emerged where this My Cool Azure app service principle can add a credential to this service principle, which has the privileged role admin role, meaning that this service principle can escalate itself up to privileged role admin and then to global admin. But also it means that David can do that as well. And it also means that any principle with control of David's user can do that as well. This, as we're going to look at, is very hard to audit as an Azure admin. It's very hard to find these kinds of attack paths using just the built-in Azure portal or even the Azure APIs. So these are two different ways that attack paths can emerge in just Azure AD. We haven't even looked at like Azure Resource Manager yet, but we're going to. And what about why these attack paths persist? Why do they stick around? Why are they so hard 
to audit and find and mitigate. So that brings us to this next section, which is just talking about attack paths, how they, how they appear as lists versus how they appear as graphs. There's a famous quote from a distinguished engineer and vice president at Microsoft named John Lambert. John said, defenders think in lists, attackers think in graphs. As long as this is true, attackers win. So if you're just using the built-in tooling in Azure and you want to audit for these kinds of dangerous configurations that may exist in your Azure Active Directory tenant, what you're going to be looking at is something like this. So here in the top left, we're looking at a subscription and we're looking at the identity and access control role assignments. And so we have a list of what principles have the contributor role, the owner role, etc. And here we're looking at a, an Azure resource and we're looking at the managed identity assignment that this thing has. We'll talk more about that in case you're not familiar. Here we're looking at what principles have the privileged role assignment uh, currently active. And here we're looking at what principles have the cloud application administrator uh, assignment currently assigned. So if you're looking at these things in isolation, you would never be able to tell that there is actually an attack path that can lead to initial access into Azure and then turn that into full control of the entire environment. You wouldn't be able to see that just looking at these lists. And even if we hone in on the particular configurations that enable this attack path, if we look at the privileged role admins, the cloud app admins, the explicit owners of a particular app, even here, it's hard to, it's hard to understand how the attack path works. So this is the list-based thinking that John Lambert at Microsoft is warning us about. This is how most defenders see their networks and compare that to the attacker view, how the attacker sees the network. They see it as a graph. They see it as these nodes and edges and they see the attack paths that are formed out of these connections. The next section that we're going to talk about, we're going to look at an attack path demo, but I want to check in uh, with uh, Jennifer, with Brian, see if there's any questions that we want to address at this point. Hey, Andy, um, no questions as of yet. I, um, for folks, if you want to see the chat, I post some questions uh, in there. I'm just curious about how people are determining the consequences of the configurations like Andy just showed, you know, how they, how are they doing that today? Um, if you want to post that in the chat and I'll bring up yeah. any questions to Andy that come in. Cool. Okay, great. Okay. So let's look at an example attack path. And so we're going to look at what are the steps that a real attacker can take to first of all, get access into an Azure AD tenant in the first place, do their data collection, find an attack path, and then execute that attack path in order to escalate their rights all the way up to global admin. So the first step is initial access. And this initial access is going to abuse a thing called OIDC or Open ID Connect. Open ID Connect is a way for, in this example, a GitHub branch to be able to authenticate to Azure AD as a service principal without granting that GitHub repository access to the password or certificate for that service principal. So this is a really effective way of mitigating the risk of putting passwords out there so that an attacker can just find the password. But if the attacker gets control of this GitHub organization, 
they're going to be able to turn this into initial access into Azure AD. So we're going to look at how that works. Here's our example uh, GitHub repository and branch. And so as the attacker, I'm going to find this innocuous looking GitHub action. And this GitHub action, the steps that this thing is going to take are defined in a YAML file. In this YAML file, you can see that we have a client ID specified. This is the object ID for the service principle in Azure AD. The tenant ID, so this is my research Azure AD tenant ID. And then we have uh, just a very simple AZ binary command that this thing is going to run. It's just, it's just going to list out the security groups in, uh, in my tenant. So I'm going to edit this so that the command does something a little more evil. And what I want this thing to do is I want it to produce the JWT for this service principle so that I can take that token and authenticate as the service principle elsewhere outside the context of this GitHub repository. So I edited that run book so that now it's going to try to export the JWT and we'll see what the job output looks like. You can see right here where it says access token star 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 that GitHub is actually censoring or obfuscating this output because it knows that this is a secret. So this is a good step on GitHub's part to obfuscate this kind of sensitive output. But this thing is creating a virtual machine. It's creating a Ubuntu virtual machine and giving us basically a bash terminal. So we can do all kinds of fun things in bash to get around this. What we're going to do is we're going to go back to the YAML file and instead of just doing az account get access token, we're going to assign the output of that command to a bash variable. And furthermore, we're going to base64 encode that output. So then the GitHub output is going to be base64 encoded and GitHub isn't going to know that there is a secret in that and it's going to produce the entire base64 payload in this job output. We'll click on this, we'll look at the output. There is our base64 payload, which we can just copy and paste and debase64 it. And there is our access token. So this access token, we can now use to authenticate to, uh, in this example, the Azure Graph API. And we're going to be doing so as that service principle. Here's just a quick POC. That was our access token we pulled out of the GitHub job. And then we're just doing a very, very basic invoke rest method against the service principles endpoint for the graph API. And we're listing out the first service principle that came back. And this is just to prove that we are authenticated as that service principle. We do have valid authentication into the Azure AD tenant. And so our next step is gonna be some data collection. And that data collection is going to result in some intelligence for us as the attacker. That intelligence is going to be in the form of a graph. And so we're going to start mapping out the steps that we've taken so far. So we had initial access into this GitHub organization. That gives us control of every repo, uh, every branch, and every action in that GitHub organization. There is this OIDC connection to our service principle. And so that gave us our initial access into Azure AD. I'm not going to show the process of using Azure Hound to collect more information because we have a big refactor of Azure Hound coming. And I want to show you the most up to date version of Azure Hound when I can. What I show you right now would be outdated very, very quickly. So we're going to skip that step for now.
The next step is we're going to escalate our privileges to subscription owner. This is the Bloodhound, the free and open source Bloodhound uh, interface. So at this point, we have used our JWT that we extracted out of the GitHub action. We have collected a bunch of information from the target Azure AD tenant. We've imported that into Bloodhound and now we are exploring it. So what we found is we searched for our OADC connected app. This is the service principle that we're authenticating as. We found that this service principle has the cloud app admin role scoped specifically to this other service principle called Azure Deployment Automation. That means that we can add a credential to that service principle and then authenticate uh, as that service principle. Here is the object ID for that target service principle. So again, we're just hitting the very basic MS Graph API. Then we are going to add a key credential to that service principle at this endpoint right here. So we're doing a post action to the add password endpoint for that service principle. And the description we're giving that credential is super legit secret. Trust me, I would never lie to you. And then the result of this query that we just did is we're going to have the clear text password effectively for that service principle. And you can see that clear text password there. Then we're going to use that clear text password to get a new token this new token, we are now authenticated as that new service principle in our attack path. At this point, we're going to collect some more information, put that into the Bloodhound database. And now, now that we are authenticated as this, this service principle here, B, we now have a lot more information about the environment. This first service principle may not have been able to read anything else except for its explicit control of this other principle. Now that we have access to this principle, we're going to be able to start reading a whole lot more. So we can see, even before we get there, we can see how our attack path is going to conclude. And we can see the next step in our attack path, which is here. So that service principle B, we discover that it is the explicit owner, or rather it has the Azure admin role of owner against a subscription object. This subscription has a descendant resource group. This resource group has a descendant logic app. In Azure, so in Azure Resource Manager, these role assignments always inherit down to all descendant objects. So if I have ownership of this subscription right here, that means I also have ownership of the resource group and I also have ownership of the logic app. And when you're auditing these descendant objects, you will see those descendant Azure admin role assignments. You, you will see those reflect on these descendant objects. This logic app has what is called a managed identity assignment against a particular service principle back up in Azure Active Directory. I'm gonna show you how we can abuse this I wasn't going to show this because I had an open case with MSRC because I thought there was potentially a serviceable bug for them to fix with this. But they came back and they said there actually is no bug. It's actually working as intended. And I, I agree with them. I agree with their, with their decision there. So I am going to show you how, as an attacker, we can abuse this. So we're, we're going to be authenticated as service principle B. 
because we are the owner of this logic app, we can modify the workflow within this logic app. We can modify that workflow so that it performs some kind of evil action. That evil action that I like to take is just extracting again the JWT for the managed identity. I want to be able to pull that token out and use it somewhere else. This is a video showing how that's, how that's done. Over here on the left, I have my uh, workflow within the Logic app. And in the workflow, I have added this evil action. This evil action is going to do a post against my evil web server. My evil web server is here on the right. And as part of this post, it is going to try to authenticate as the managed identity with an audience for the token set as the Microsoft Graph API. Then in the Azure GUI, I'm going to run a test of this workflow. And you're gonna see here on the right on my evil web server, you're gonna see the JWT for this service principle pop up over here on the right. So I will start up a very simple Python web server. <clears throat> We will run the workflow and almost instantaneously, you can see that over here on the right, we have captured the JWT for that service principle. This JWT, as we saw before, we can use this to now authenticate as the more privileged service principle. And that is going to be service principle C. Now that we have control of service principle C, we are going to be able to escalate our rights all the way up to global admin. So let's look at privilege escalation to global admin. We'll start off again in the Bloodhound GUI. And I'm going to start off by looking at the second service principle that we had control of. And Bloodhound is, Bloodhound is kind of like Google Maps for Azure and for on-prem Active Directory. So what you saw me do there is I had a, I had a source and I had a destination. So I said, I want to see if there is a path to go from Azure deployment automation and end at control of the tenant. And sure enough, there is. We just executed this part of that attack path, taking control of this service principle here, which is called Azure SP Creator. Our next step is going to be adding a secret to this other service principle called App Role Assigner. This service principle is able to grant Azure AD admin roles. So then we're going to grant it the global admin role, and then our attack path will be finished. So here we're authenticating as our second to last service principle. And then uh, we're getting the app role ID for the MS graph app role called role management dot read write dot directory. We will then grant our service principle that app role. That app role of role management dot read write dot directory gives us the ability to promote ourselves or anybody else to global admin. So our next step then is going to be to get the role template ID for the global admin role 
And you can see that role template ID is here. And finally, we will authenticate as the last service principle and we will activate it into the global admin role assignment, which is what we're doing with this REST method request right here. And then the output of that request is telling us that there is now a role assignment with this ID at this scope, which is just the root of Azure AD. This principle ID, which is our last service principle, this role definition ID, which as we saw before is the uh, uh, global admin role template ID. And at that point, we are now a global admin in our target Azure Active Directory tenant. So this is the attack path that we just walked through. And you could argue that these discrete configurations, as they are seen in isolation, you could argue that individually they are compliant with uh, least privilege. Uh, you know, we're not we're not giving this service principle global admin. We're giving it this app role assignment dot read write dot all. So you you may you may find documentation or you may find resources that tell you do this instead of granting this thing global admin because this is a, a, like least privilege. But what they don't tell you is that this actually lets you give yourself global admin. This. Uh, app role assignment for MS Graph, service principle endpoint dot read write dot all. This may also be something that could be seen as least privilege, but this actually lets you create credentials for all other service principles. So that goes on and on and on. And, and so seen individually, none of these things really stand out as being huge problems, but from the attacker's perspective, they form a complete and very practical to exploit attack path. So how complicated can this actually get? This, this can get very, very, very complicated. So you might have multiple subscriptions, multiple resource groups, multiple resources that can have managed identity assignments, and you may have varying levels of privilege uh, for those service principles. This could be explicit or implicit. So those individual configurations though, they can turn from you know, being seen as just individual hierarchical relationships and control relationships and managed identity relationships. They can change from that into attack paths, you know, fully formed attack paths that, that lead all the way from the bottom of Azure all the way back up to the top. The next section I have for you is how to identify and eliminate these attack paths. So why don't why don't I check in and have a drink of my coffee and see if there's any questions from uh, Jennifer that you want to surface? Yeah, um, there was actually some discussion in the chat around um, using Sharp Hound and Defender uh, for endpoint blocking it as a hacking tool. Um, so, how do you, how do people get around this, and uh, what do defenders need to do to utilize it? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, Microsoft and some other vendors have flagged Sharp Hound as malicious. There are various ways to deal with this. I think probably the best way as a defender is is going to be like what Jesse said is to add an exclusion for that binary uh, in defender. Uh, obviously, you should be very careful about adding exclusions and you should have that exclusion be as specific as possible. You know, it is for this binary with this hash. It is not for just anything in this folder or whatever, I think making those exclusions as, as specific as possible is how you can do that safely. So unfortunately, 
yes, Sharphound does get flagged as malicious. It is open source. And so you can audit the source code for yourself if you like. You can also compile it from source if you like. Uh, but unfortunately, even if you compile it, it will still be flagged as malicious. Uh, so I, I agree with Jesse that the best thing a defender can do there is to uh, add an exception uh, for for Sharpham. Right. Great. That was it. Thank you. All right. So let's move on. Let's talk about how to deal with this problem of attack paths. And we're going to look at three different things. And for this, we're going to be using the free version of Bloodhound. Uh, so Bloodhound is free and open source. You can download it today and start using it. And the first thing we're going to look at is just auditing control of objects in Azure. When you do this in the Azure portal, things can get obscured because of group memberships or because of implicit control of objects that don't show up when you're auditing, for example, uh, a service principle. You don't, you don't necessarily know easily who all actually has the ability to take control of that service principle. So in this example, we're gonna pull up a virtual machine using the FOSS Bloodhound GUI. So we'll just do a search for that and we'll click on that item that says win 2019-002. When we click on that, we will get this node entity panel, which is going to tell us some things about that virtual machine. It's going to tell us everything that Bloodhound knows about it. Then if we click on this item right here that says first degree, or I'm sorry, this item right here that says explicit object controllers, we'll see there's a, there's a three right there. So we'll click on that and we'll see that there are three principles that have explicit control of this virtual machine. So Jeff, Alice, and this service principal here have either the generic contributor role or the more specific virtual machine contributor role. The contributor role against a virtual machine lets you execute system commands on the VM. So you can basically do the same thing as like PS exec with contributor access. But if we look at unrolled object controllers, we can see there's actually nine uh, objects that have control of this thing. And it's because of this security group that has the owner role against that virtual machine. So this group unrolls out to include all these other principles here that belong to that group. And so we can see visually, how does Jason have control of this VM? Well, it's because he belongs to this group called My Security Group, and the group itself has ownership of the virtual machine. You can do this for not every kind of object in Azure, but most, and I would argue the most impactful one. So you can do this for service principles, for the tenant, for users, for security groups, for apps, uh, so you can do this kind of one-off auditing for all of the most important objects in Azure. We can also use the free and open source version of Bloodhound to find attack paths that are interesting for attackers to find and exploit. So any node in the Bloodhound GUI, if you right click on it, you'll get this menu. And you can click on shortest paths to here. This will run a query against the Bloodhound database to find the shortest paths. So the quickest way to go from anywhere to this particular thing. And in this example, it's this uh, virtual machine. The result of that might look something like this. So over here, we have kind of our usual suspects of who, who it was that had control of this virtual machine. But then on the far left, we have all these other objects that have attack paths leading to the compromise of that machine. So as an example, this Azure app, if this thing is compromised somehow, this thing has a service principle that it authenticates as. So there it is, my test app. And this test app in my 
research tenant, I granted it the global admin role. That gives it global admin against the default directory tenant object. This tenant object contains all of these other objects. And if you have control of the tenant object, you have control of everything that that tenant uh, control or contains. So as an example, we could just say, uh, well, I'm going to pick on Rohan. So with control of the tenant, the tenant controls Rohan. So I'm going to reset Rohan's password. Then knowing Rohan's new password, I'm going to authenticate as Rohan, and then I'm going to execute privileged commands on this virtual machine, and then steal whatever kind of sensitive information is on that thing, or spin up a crypto miner, or deploy ransomware, or do whatever impactful action it is that the adversary wants to perform against this object. Again, you can do this for anything in the Bloodhound GUI. So you could right click on this app and look at the shortest paths to it. And you can start to identify some of the uh, configurations that you might be able to change or get rid of to limit uh, some of these attack paths. The last thing that I wanna talk about is this concept called attack path management. Attack path management is a uh, methodology that we came up with to try to use the graph for defensive purposes and not just for offensive purposes. The basic, basic concept with attack path management is all about making it easy to do tiered administration and least privilege. Tiered administration in particular is a big focus for attack path management. And so I wanna explain that using some visuals. If you're not familiar with the concept of tiered administration, you basically divide up your users, groups, other assets into different administrative tiers. And so tier zero is the most powerful, the most sensitive objects, and tier zero has control of everything. And tier zero is what needs to be protected most effectively. Anything outside of tier zero might be tier one for your server admins or tier two for your workstation admins, and then just kind of the rest of everything that doesn't have any kind of privilege or isn't supposed to have any kind of privilege. So in our uh, attack path that we demoed earlier, we had this service principle that could grant itself the global admin role. The global admin role is a tier zero role. You know, there's no argument there. But this service principle this configuration doesn't exist in isolation. As we saw, there are gonna be things that have control of this service principle. But then there are also gonna be things that have control of those things. And there are gonna be things that have control of those things. And so the impact of this and the bottom line here is that this configuration where this service principle can grant itself or somebody else global admin, that's bad but we can't really understand how bad that is until we have the context of what the attack paths are that can lead to the compromise of this service principle. Now, when you're dealing with this and you're trying to remediate this, something that you legitimately could do is you legitimately could say, well, I need this configuration. I need this for some kind of business critical process. And that is 100% that is valid to, to say that. So what that means is that our tier zero definition now expands to include that service principle. And we're saying that service principle now is a tier zero object. But now instead of having one problem to fix, now you've got three problems to fix.
One of the easiest ways that you can find these kind of one-off candidates for remediation is back in the Bloodhound GUI, find the tenant object, and then just look at who has some kind of inbound control against the tenant. And so you'll be able to find global admins, privileged role admins, and you'll also find the other objects that have that control through security group delegation or through some other kind of attack path. Like Alice owns this app, which runs as this service principle, which, which has the privilege role, admin role. Finding these last steps into the tenant is gonna be the biggest bang for your buck for limiting the risk of a real adversary taking control of your tenant. So do this. If, there, if you do one thing, do this. Find the, find the tenant object, look at who has explicit control of the tenant, and start looking at what you can get rid of. Does Jeff really need global admin against the tenant? Maybe, maybe not. If he doesn't, get rid of it. Or if you can't get rid of it, make sure that this role assignment is an eligible role assignment, not a permanent role assignment, and make sure that when Jeff wants to promote himself to global admin, that he has to go through the PIM activation steps and make sure that that requires MFA and make sure that requires some kind of third party sign off from a different person besides Jeff or Tim or Joe, et cetera. Make sure that, make sure that your PIM activation is using MFA and third party uh, authorization. So that is all that I have. And uh, Jennifer, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it back over to you. Excellent. And I'm also gonna open it up, Brian, um, uh, Patton, if you wanna identify any questions that came in. Um, let me see. Uh, yeah, one I saw back here. What privileges are yeah. required to run Azure Hound? That's a great, great question. So uh, there are two different scopes where you need to have some kind of privilege to collect this information. One of those scopes is Azure Active Directory. So at that level, you need uh, just read access, and so the safest way that I know of to do that would be to grant yourself or the service principal you're collecting that information as, give that thing the MS Graph app role called directory.read. I think that's the, the end of it. Maybe directory.read.all. I think that might be the end of it. You could also give it global reader, but that gives read access to security information, which you may not want to give it. The other scope is Azure Resource Manager. At that scope, you need to have the reader role. And the easiest way to do that so that you're covering everything is find the root management group, grant yourself the reader role at the root management group. That's going to descend down to every subscription, every resource group, every resource, and you'll be able to read the privileged uh, role assignments for everything in Azure RM. Excellent. Hey, I had uh, a question. You mentioned Bloodhound uh, as open source and a paid version. What's the difference there? So there's a really good blog post that we put out that shows the differences between the free version and the commercial version. But I think the, the long and the short of it is that the free version of Bloodhound is all about the pen tester or the red team use case. So it was made by us, for us, uh, when we were pen testers and red teamers. The commercial version is for defenders, made by defenders. And the commercial version has uh, features that are appropriate for a defender and that are also appropriate for it being a commercial product. So 
It handles all of the data collection for you. It runs all of this analysis for you constantly, automatically, all the time. It produces findings that are rank ordered by what impact are you going to have on reducing attack path risk in your environment by doing certain things. So every finding is prioritized with, uh, you know, uh, when, when, like, what, what should you tackle first? And it looks like Mohammed just posted that link for enterprise Excellent. versus FOSS in the chat. So thanks, thanks for doing that, Mohammed. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I did. Somebody asked an interesting question. How bad do you normally see these maps? Uh, curious in your usually, experience. yeah. So, like, so what we see on the screen right here, usually it's pretty similar to this. I would say the other maps where we're just like kind of arbitrarily saying, "Show me the shortest paths to here." The FOSS version of the software usually can't handle how bad it is. So usually the FOSS version will will. Uh, choke because it's trying to display too much information. The enterprise version doesn't have that problem. And so usually if you're just looking at kind of for any particular object, how bad are all the attack paths that lead to it, it's usually very, very, very bad. Interesting. Somebody did ask if there is a Sentinel hunt query or out of the box query that can assist in these this SPN Azure investigation. I believe so. I believe so. I think my recommendation would be to look at um, Matt Zorich on Twitter. Uh, he's been sharing KQL queries that I think can can probably answer that. Uh, yeah, I think I think that's probably the best answer I have for that. I'm not I'm not an expert in Sentinel, but uh, Matt definitely is. Okay, excellent. Um, I'm going to ask, how do they purchase Bloodhound Enterprise? Is that through Quest? Looks like Brian answered that one. Um, yes, here's another question. How do I find a list of all Azure SPNs and app registrations with their certificate expiration dates? I think there's, there's different ways that you can do that, but I think the easiest way for that would be uh, just hitting the raw API or a little bit easier way would be to use the MS Graph PowerShell uh, commandlets. And once you've authenticated and have a token and can use those commandlets, you'll be able to list out all of the service principles, all of the app registrations, and you'll be able to see uh, if you have read access to this, you'll be able to see what the expiration is for their certs. And I, I would do it that way. I would not rely on the portal GUI for that because you're gonna have to click on one thing, you know, at a time. And we've seen Azure tenants that have like 40,000, 50,000 or more service principles. And I'm, I'm not gonna click through 50,000 things. So that's, that's what I would do. Um, that probably, warrants like a, a proper blog post to talk about exactly how to do all that because there's there's a lot of detail to to dive in there but that's that's a really good question excellent um somebody mentioned nice tool and um alex shared uh um matt's twitter on the kql tips so thank you it's uh it's a good chat um people can share this so um if you don't mind i think we're at the top of the or yeah we're near the end of this time i just um I want to mention to everyone here on the line that um, take a look at the experts conference. Andy's going to be there. Um, he'll be speaking again on a very similar topic. Um, we've got you know Sean Metcalf, Alex Weiner. We've got a whole host of people from the Azure AD security team who roll up in Alex, um, and then some other uh, third-party experts. Uh, so it's definitely the place to come and ask those questions um, that you have. So take a look. Katie just posted the link to the experts conference. Um, and I see one other question came in and I'll ask that and then we'll then we'll just wrap this up. So Adam asked, does Bloodhound show escalation path in hybrid environments? Kind of, sort of. It's not as complete as it will be. Uh, so eventually that will be complete and you'll be able to see things like um, 
you know, a user has its password synchronizing up into Azure or other way around, or you have like group membership synchronization. Like there, there's a lot there that uh, we don't have yet, but that we'll, uh, we'll have in the product uh, as soon as we can. Excellent. Well, we shared in the chat a link to the GitHub version um, for Bloodhound. Um, I just want to thank everybody for your time and attention today. Um, Andy, thank you for sharing your expertise. Uh, this is a, um, uh, a definitely a, probably more of a nascent or emerging uh, problem that people are, are, are really starting to realize and struggle with. So I appreciate what you're able to share. Um, and we will see you at the experts conference and everyone else. I hope to see you there and thanks for joining us today. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.